guys, good morning. So yesterday, um, one of my colleagues asked in one of the groups if the difference between um, stoneware, earthenware, and porcelain was the temperature that they get fired to. And of course, we could say the short answer is yes, or we could say it's the vitrification or the porosity. But there is a little bit more to that. It is actually all of these functions are a product of the composition of the clay. So the answer is that the difference between the earthenware, the stoneware, and the porcelain is actually the clay composition. So let's talk about the clay composition and then we'll kind of try to touch on um, what it does and what properties it gives to the clay. Um, I will try not to make it into like a three hour lecture. <laughs> I'll do my best, but it's really fascinating actually, really, really interesting. So in the past, I have made videos where I've kind of alluded to the fact of like how the clay forms and I made some really sweeping generalizations saying, for example, that um, kaolins and ball clay is the same, they're not. Um, they're similar, they're cousins, but they're not. So um, let's go back into it, okay? Let's talk about it. So where does the clay come from? So you start out with a rock, right, on a mountain. Um, and it can be something like granite, anything that has um, silicates in it. So it will decompose into your metal oxides. And Oh, by the way, and why does it decompose? Because it comes from deep inside the earth. So the, um, the chemicals that are stable deep underground with the heat and the pressure there, when they surface, they're no longer stable. And now all of a sudden they have to decompose to become stable again. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so back to it. So they decompose because of that into metal oxides, into um, quartz, the micas, the feldspars, and these ions. Now, I'm just gonna give you a little interesting fact. So the ions here, you see this is the first part of the salt, right? So you would have like sodium chloride. So this is why our oceans are salty and our rivers are not. So these ions, they flow down in the river and the water is not salty yet, right? It's just hard, it has minerals in it. So they flow down and they hit the ocean waters. Now in the ocean, you have volcanic eruptions and volcanic eruptions produce things like chlorides. So now your sodium, for example, can mix with a chloride and it produces sodium chloride. So when it hits those volcanic waters in the ocean, it becomes salty. Anyway, the interesting part to us is the, the micas and the feldspars that are going to produce these clay materials. See, um, ball clay, ball clay is a naturally found clay, okay? It is not a single substance. There are many different types of ball clay. And depending on which ball clay you use, you can get very, very different results because they can have, um, you know, a different flow to them, different vitrification, they can have, um, you know, very different properties to them. Because it's not a single material, it is a mix of all of these things, right? So you can have your kale nights, you can have your bentonites, eyelids, and a whole bunch of other things in there, like your minerals that did not get um, broken down completely. And quartz pretty much stays quartz. Now I will give you a little heads up. So quartz and silica chemically is the same compound. The chemical formula is the same. However, they're not the same physically. So quartz is a crystal form of silica. That's like saying water, right? Ice and water. I mean, the chemical formula is the same, but the actual thing is not, right? It has very different physical properties. So just keep that in mind, just so you know. Um, when you see them, um, th they're almost synonymous, but keep in mind that the physical properties are different, okay? All right, so this is our clay right here. So your clay is going to be these clay particles, and it's going to have a little bit of leftover feldspars, it can have a little bit of leftover micas and quartz, and um, of course it can have some oxides, which is what gives terracotta its red color, right? Iron oxides. And some of these guys might be hanging out also. Because as things break down, they don't break down completely, they don't break down evenly. So you can have a mix of those things. So this is clay in general, okay? Now 
let's talk about specific types of clay. I wrote it all out for you guys. <laughs> okay, so here we go. We have the earthenwares, we have the stonewares, and we have the porcelains. Okay, so these are the typical formulas. These are percentages, okay? They should all add up to 100 if I did it right. Um, and these are the typical compositions of these three different types of clays. Now, um, let's talk about what each one of them does. The ball clay that I was telling you about, the clay that is literally dug up and processed on the site, that adds workability. So ball clay is really, um, it's micas, uh, micas quartzes and um, kaolins. And um, it, it's a mix of those things. And it adds a lot of like plasticity and um, it prevents your clay from being short, okay? Now, um, your feldspars here, the feldspars are really important. The feldspars are um, important for vitrification. So these are the guys that are going to get really, really fluid and they're going to fuse everything together in your clay. Um, your um, quartzes, you would think, right, that silica contributes to vitrification and it does contribute, but it actually has more to do with the glaze fit. Um, it allows, um, it, it increases the thermal expansion of your clay. So when it cools, it can shrink with the glaze together and that way it doesn't craze because if the glaze shrinks and the, the clay doesn't, you're going to get crazing. So, um, so right, so um, quartz is more, has to do more of um, thermal expansion of your clay. And then, of course, the kaolins, right? The kaolins are, um, so they're, they're a little bit different. Kaolins are these big, white, flat particles, and um, they have, like, very little wiggle room. <laughs> I'm trying to, like, think of, like, the most non-scientific way of, um, of saying it, but basically they're, they're really, really hard to melt. It's the essence of the clay itself, minus all the workability, minus all the plasticity, it's the harsh chemical itself. And they're actually used in grogs and um, they're used in, um, in your kiln washes. Uh, I, I think it's like 50% kaolin. So, um, so what are the differences? What do we see here? You can see I wrote low fire, high fire, high fire, why? Okay, so notice one big, big difference. The earthenware and the stoneware both have ball clay, right? Stoneware has a lot of it. Earthenware has, or earthenware is like a good mix of all things, okay? Um, but porcelains do not. They don't have ball clay. Um, they're very pure, okay? Porcelains are, they're really just almost like quartz, kaolin, and feldspar. In order to make them workable at all, so we can make anything at all with them, what we add is the bentonite. So that's one of those um, little clay materials from the decomposition chart that actually stay very white, but they do add workability to the clay. Um, so that makes porcelain very special. Now, the other thing is you have to look at your feldspars, right? The feldspars is your vitrification. So the feldspars for the earthenware and the stoneware are fairly low, but you see a jump when you get to porcelain. That's because porcelain when it's fully fired, it's going to fuse almost glass-like. There's a lot of feldspars in there. They're going to flow and fuse everything. And that makes it um, a very highly vitrified clay. Um, quartzes, you know, it's, we're gonna kind of, well, I don't wanna skip it. <laughs> I really wanna talk about everything, but um, it's not really possible. But um, we need a lot of quartzes in earthenware because earthenware is very, very porous. Um, and so you worry about glaze fit quite a bit. Um, stoneware is, it, it's pretty good by itself. It doesn't need a lot of help, so um, we don't need a ton of quartz. Porcelains, however, they don't shrink a lot because they're almost pure kaolin, so you have to add a lot of quartz to it so that we can glaze them. Otherwise, I mean, you could fire it without the glaze and it would be fine if it didn't have so much quartz. But if you want to glaze your porcelain, you're going to need some quartz in that clay. And then, of course, the kaolins, right? That's the, the super fancy um, and obnoxious guys. So in um, earthenware, you see um, about 25%, is that right? Yeah, 25% um, stoneware, much higher, which is why it's 
much tighter clay body. It's um, 40% and porcelains, of course, is the highest. So because of these chemical properties of each of these ingredients and the mix that is created, um, your earthenware is going to be a very low fire clay. It actually will not vitrify. It doesn't have that flowing glass-like structure that then solidifies as the kiln cools. Um, matter of fact, it's called uh, sintering. So the way um, earthenware is held together is the particles themselves just kind of get bonded to each other, um, as opposed to porcelain where they get fused together with feldspars, okay? So earthenware, if you break earthenware, it almost crumbles. Like think about terracotta, right? When you break off a piece of a terracotta cut, pot, it um, has like almost like a um, like crumbs, like texture to it. Where stoneware and porcelain is really more glass-like, especially once you get to porcelains. You know, it's really um, breaking a piece of porcelain is almost like breaking like um, a, a piece of like solid glaze, you know, it's that type of texture. Um, so earthenware gets fired at a low um, temperature. It will actually bunt and blister if you hire, uh, fire it higher. Stoneware and porcelains get fired much higher. Earthenware is very porous because of the sintering types of um, adhesions that the molecules have, while stoneware is much less so, and porcelain is almost completely non-porous because everything is fused with those feldspars as they flow in between the kaolin molecules. And, there's like almost no space in there. So your absorption for your um, earthenware is going to be very high. And by the time you get to porcelain, it's going to be almost non-existent. Um, so, um, and, and then of course the plasticity we have to talk about. So earthenware is very forgiving, very plastic. Those particles uh, before or after they move around a lot, where in porcelain, um, those kaolins want to line up just so, it's not plastic at all. Without the bentonites, it's, it's almost impossible to work with. And um, therefore it's, it's really, really much harder to work with. But the, the end result though, with earthenware, you have a um, more colored clay, you know, it's got these earthy, beautiful textures to it. Um, definitely not translucent though. Um, by the time you get to stoneware, you get a little bit more of like a finer, um, color beads, you know, a, a grayish or a beige. Um, and then the porcelains tend to be just pure white. And that is that is your kale and that is almost not mixed with anything else. Um, the other elements in, in your porcelains um, will not stain, will not add color to it. All right, so that is the difference between the earthenware, the stoneware and the porcelain. It is the composition. Okay, and the composition comes from um, basically knowing each one of those things that the original rock on the mountain broke down into, knowing what they do and what physical properties they will add to the clay body. And we mix them in such a way that we achieve certain properties, okay? And they each have their pros and they each have their cons. But this, this is the difference between the three, the three main clay bodies. I hope that was helpful. I, I know I admitted like so much. It's so hard to cover it. It's really a semester's worth of information. Um, and mineralogy is just fascinating. But um, if you guys have any specific questions, let me know. I know this was kind of a lot and a brief period of time, but um, I am gonna run along, but I will answer all comments, all questions. And if you need me to cover anything else with a video, just let me know and I don't mind, I don't mind making another one. Thank you so much and have a wonderful Monday. Bye.